Hey y'all, Erin here, and I am filming what will probably be my last YouTube video. Um, I haven't <laughs> uploaded anything since beginning of September. Um, what I have learned on this journey is that, <coughs> is that my dog doesn't like intruders. <laughs> um, is that I don't enjoy filming myself and I really don't enjoy trying to learn how to edit. So I am concluding my year of not reading any cishet white people and with that I will be concluding this YouTube journey. Uh, thanks so much for coming along with me um, and if you are at all curious about what I continue to read. I still use Goodreads. Um, I regularly update it on my Instagram and I chat constantly on Discord. So let me know if you want to stay in touch and uh, you can find me on one of those. In the meantime, let's get into it. Um, so I'm basically going to cover three topics in this video. I'm sitting on all of the pillows that are supposed to be on my bed, so hopefully my legs won't fall asleep and I can get through what will probably be a slightly longer video with a minimum of fidgeting. And I've got my lovely cinnamon orange tea here. So we can get into this. The three topics that I'm going to cover on this video are one, just my general reading statistics for the year. This is my year end wrap up video. Two, how did I feel about my experiment with going a year without reading any books by cishet white people? Um, and three, why do I believe that reading diversely is important? Um, so let's get into it. We're going to hop right into statistics for the year. Um, I read 86 books this year. There are technically still five days to go. Um, maybe I will manage to finish one more book. Maybe I won't. I have to go back to work <laughs> uh, tomorrow. So my reading will slow, um, but I did start Kindred this morning, so we'll see. Um, so as I previously said, my, my goal for this year was to read only authors of color um, from January through June, and then I thought that, you know, white but queer authors could join the party, so to speak, in July. Um, my method for determining if an author, like, fit my criteria was basically just to read their Goodreads author profile or their profile in their book. And then if they self-identified as a person of color or as a queer person, then yay, you're in. I did not like try to make any judgments based on someone's appearance because that's a little icky. Um, <laughs> so my only exception to my not reading white people rule throughout the year was comic books. Um, I don't read a lot of comic books in book form, but I do read a lot, a lot <laughs> of online like serial web comics. Um, like I think somewhere in the 70s that I'm subscribed to on various apps. So I did not try and track down or make any sort of determination on who was writing those. In a lot of the cases, I do know that they're queer people or trans people. 
in a lot of cases, I know that they are white men, white people. Um, but when you've been reading a story for 12 or 15 years, it's hard to convince yourself to take a year off and have to try and catch up. So I did just continue to read those. Um, and with the exception of comic books, at the end of the year, I read only three books by white people, all three of whom identified as queer in their uh, biography. So it was actually less than I was expecting. Um, these restrictions that I put on myself turned out not to be that arduous. So I will get into that a little bit more um, in the second section of this video. Um, so first book that I read this year was Lagoon by Nadia Corfor. Excellent way to start off the year. The last book that I have finished as of the filming of this video is Consumed by Aja Barber, um, which I also highly recommend. That one is a nonfiction. Um, so overall, I read 61% fiction and 39% nonfiction, which I'm pretty pleased with that split. It's actually much more nonfiction that I had than I had originally anticipated. Uh, my goal was to read one nonfiction book a month, and I ended up reading 33 nonfiction books. So, almost three a month. Um, the other goal that I had had was to read one book of poetry each month, and I didn't manage that. I think I only read six poetry books. So, uh, my top five genres were fantasy, LGBTQIA, young adult, science fiction, and race. Uh, it was fun watching those shift through the year because fantasy and queer basically stayed right up at the top, but halfway through the year, poetry was much higher, race was not on there yet. Um, just, just kind of a fun thing to track. Story graphs is fun. <laughs> Um, so favorite new authors that I discovered this year, uh, Nettie Okorafor, I ended up reading four of her books this year, so she was my most read author for the year. I really enjoyed three of them. <laughs> uh, Who Fears Death was definitely a miss for me. Um, just didn't, there was a lot of, there was a lot of trauma <laughs> in that book. Um, but Lagoon and Remote Control, I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed. Um, Sylvia Moreno-Garcia, I read three of her books. Also really enjoyed all three of them. I absolutely adore the way that she shifts genres. Because the three books that I read, none of them were anything like each other. And that was really fun to me. Um... In nonfiction, Ijioma Aluo, I read both of her books. She only has two books out. She is definitely someone who every book she writes, I will be purchasing. Just, it's just a fact. <laughs> um, and I would highly, highly, highly recommend Mediocre. If you haven't picked it up, you should do so. Um, it is Jess Owen's book, Communa Read, uh, nonfiction book clubs book pick for January. I have already, I read it this year already. I am probably going to read it again in January for that. It was that good. Um, and favorite new young adult author for me is definitely Aiden Thomas. Um, they are also going to be an auto buy for me. Their books are just so like sweet and cozy and they're not difficult <laughs> to read and you know sometimes you just need the sweet and cozy um and they definitely deliver on that so very glad that I picked up their books too um honorable mention on the favorite authors for the year is definitely going to be in K. Jem Jemison. I don't know why I want to mess up her last name every time my brain just 
scrambles the letters into a different order. <laughs> uh, so she's only an, <laughs> only an honorable mention because I did actually read The City We Became last year. So she is not a new discovery for me this year, but I did read all three books in the Broken Earth trilogy this year. Um, it took me literally eight days <laughs> to read all three of them, and it only took that long because I had to go to work. Uh, yeah, devoured. C literally could not put them down. So good. Uh, so that's, that's my basic statistics for the year. And so now I'm going to shift into topic number two. What did I learn from this experience? Um, so I will freely admit that my primary concern heading into this challenge to myself was that I wouldn't have enough to read. Um, I, I have always been a big reader. When I graduated from college, though, I was really depressed, really burnt out. Um, and I, I didn't stop reading, but I stopped reading anything that would challenge me. And so I got to a point where I was reading books that were like such simple fluff that I could read a 250, 300 page book in a day. Um, because it just didn't take long. Uh, and I'd forgotten what it was like to read books that like aren't self-published and free on the internet and that have real substance to them. Um, so it did slow me down a lot. I did only read 86 books this year. Um, but I, at, at no point did I feel like, oh my gosh, I'm running out of things to read, which had kind of been my concern because my primary method of finding new books to read prior to this year was to get them off of BookBub lists and like pick the free ones and the ones that I'm was being sent were predominantly by white women, you know, paranormal romance, kind of fluffy, just no substance books. So since I was looking at that and I was not seeing authors of color making those lists, I was thinking, oh my gosh, this is going to be really tricky for me. Um, so what I did was I found a few booktubers who's taste in books matched my own and I started looking to see what they were reading um and as soon as I switched gears from free books on the internet to you know getting books from the library again purchasing like actual real physical books again it, there was no point at which I thought oh my god I'm running out of things to read there were a lot of points where I thought "Ooh, what should I read next because I had so many options that it it was like, how do I narrow them down? And I still have plenty of books on my list that I didn't get to. Um, so that was really a pleasant discovery for me. <laughs> that, that not all the books out there are trash. <laughs> so my other concern going into this challenge self-imposed challenge um was that I was gonna feel like I was missing out on reading books and really truthfully there were only three times in the whole year that I felt like oh I want to read that book but it's by a white guy um so I think some of that was the you know the I don't read a lot of new releases, so I don't really ever have that like, <laughs> oh, I'm missing out, everyone else is reading this thing, or it's brand new, and I want to partake, because that's just kind of not my con book consumption style. Um, so yeah, there were, there were three times this year where I felt like I was missing out. So one was, I've been following along with, um, 
Free, The Locked Book Titian, and Nicole from Who Picked This Book. They're doing Uncle Rick's Read Along, and they've been reading all of Rick Riordan's books. Um, and I had read all of them last year, with the exception of The Trials of Apollo, the last five books. Um, so I was able to keep up with the video, their live discussions, predominantly because I was, you know, remembering what I had read the year prior. I wasn't reading them along with them. So in the last, I think it was in November, that they started The Trials of Apollo, which I haven't read. And so that was the first time that I was like, mm, missing out. <laughs> um, might have been October, actually. What is time? <laughs> um, but the fact that I made it well into fall before I thought that I was missing out on an activity because of this self-imposed challenge, I think it was pretty good. Um, so the next time that I felt like I was missing out was you know, the new Dune movie came out and I read half of Dune many, many years ago. Um, and then I had to give it back to the library and I just didn't care enough to check it back out. Um, and now I have, I have my brother's copy. It's either right behind my butt or I moved it into the guest room with the rest of his books. I can't remember. Uh, <laughs> but so I have my brother's copy of this book and Frank Herbert is like a Tacoma hero because I do live in Tacoma and that's where he's from and so it was, you know, extra exciting and I wanted to reread the book and then see the movie and I'm in Jess Owen's book community read discord and everyone else was reading it and I was like, oh, I want to finally finish this book. Um, but the impulse passed <laughs> and I never did see the movie. <laughs> so maybe when it comes out on video, um, Maybe I'll read the book next year and watch the movie when it's out on video. We'll see. Um, once everyone in the Discord stopped talking about it, I kind of <laughs> forgot about it again and the impulse passed. And the third instance um, is again TV <laughs> related because Amazon made The Wheel of Time. The first season is out. That was one of my brother's favorite series when he was a kid, and I have never read any of them. And honestly, I don't know why. Like, he, he had them. I don't know why I didn't pick them up and read them, um, because they're right in my wheelhouse, too. Uh, you know, I'm all about that high fantasy life. <laughs> um, so... My husband and I watched the first season because my brother said, oh, fantastic, you haven't read these books. I need you to watch this TV show and tell me if it makes any sense if you don't already know the story. Um, so I will say that, yes, it did make sense, but there were definitely things in the show that I was like, I want to know more about that. Um, and now I'm just dying to read the books because we finished the first season. I want to see how closely it lines up to the books. I really want to see if the books are as queer and as diverse as the uh, TV show is, because I strongly suspect the answer is no, because it's, you know, a white guy writing it in the 90s. It just doesn't seem like it would have been pu published or promoted <laughs> if it was actually that queer and diverse. Um... My brother did say that there, there are a lot of lesbians in that book, but uh, I didn't want to ask him about the diversity because in telling me that much, he totally gave me a spoiler, which I have thankfully forgotten. So that's cool. Um, <laughs> but at the time I was like, damn it. Um, so yeah, didn't feel like I was missing out really, other than those three very specific instances that will be in the case of Wheel of Time, remedied in five days. Um, 
My other concern was that I, I am a rereader. I get a lot of comfort from revisiting stories that I'm already super familiar with and given the ongoing stresses of the pandemic and you know my job is a customer facing job so I do have to like interact with people for work potentially germy disgusting people um yeah just you know <laughs> life stress these are still difficult and unprecedented times and I was concerned that without my typical coping me mechanism of rereading books that I would not be able to handle that stress in ways that were necessarily healthy for me um but I just found new comfort reads <laughs> so I actually read uh The House on the Cerulean Sea and Cemetery Boys twice each because I really enjoyed them and they became my comfort reads for the year um and that's pretty typical for me to like it's not at all unusual for me to read a book pick it back up and immediately read it again or read it within two months of having read it the first time um and I've even had the impulse to read The House on the Surly and see a third time so yeah that's that's just how I roll um So in, in a lot of ways, what I learned from this experience was that um, it actually felt like a returning to myself, the, the core of who I am as a person, because one of the core things in my identity is that I am a reader. Um, and for a long time that that had ceased to be true to the point where yeah, I, I like, <laughs> I didn't forget. Um, I, so I was working through the Me and White Supremacy handbook um, with a friend of mine and we were doing the prompts together. And I was like, this is all really familiar to me. I've done a lot of this work before. And it struck me that I was like, oh yeah, I have a bachelor's degree <laughs> in gender and race studies. And I had moved so far away from doing that work that I forgot that that is knowledge that is solid within me. And that, um, that is available to me and that I can call upon, um, and that that is part of who I am, that I have always been a person who was concerned with equity. And, you know, I used to do a lot more volunteer work. And uh, so this year of challenging myself to read, I started off with just, it was just read non-white authors. And because that led me to finding new sources of books, that led me back to the things that I had been really passionate about, um, that I'm still really passionate about, and that I had just become so mired in depression that I didn't forget that they were issues, but I forgot that they were things that I was capable of changing, of working on, um, which I know is a white privilege in and of itself, but mental health struggles are real, <laughs> you know? Um, and I've become so lost in that depression that I just didn't, I didn't see a way out. And this challenge to myself has brought so much reading back into my life and it's really brought me back to who I think of myself as, who I am. And that's been a really, delightful and unexpected side effect of this reading journey. Um, 
it felt really good <laughs> to like stretch those critical reading muscles to read about gender again to engage with these topics that at one point I had been so engaged in that I spent four years getting a degree um and that's not something that I'm gonna let lapse again <laughs> uh, so if I mean if for no other reason I thought that that made this all worthwhile um and that segues us nicely into our third topic for this video of why do I think that it matters to read diversely? Um, this is something that I think, I don't know if Booktube at large talks about it a lot, but, but at the very least, the, you know, <laughs> five or six Booktubers that I genuinely follow and enjoy um, talk about fairly often of why does diversity in your reading matter and I'm I don't think that just reading diversely is enough that's not going to be how we solve problems of inequity in the world um, but reading diversely does help us remember that these are issues that we need to be tackling and not just that we need to be tackling, but that we can tackle, that, that there are solutions. They're not just problems. And if you don't, if you don't look at the problem, you don't look and see that there are solutions too. Um, so that's one aspect of why I think reading diversely matters. Um, from a strictly monetary standpoint, <laughs> You know, publishing pays attention to what people do and don't buy. They pay attention to library usage counts and what libraries are buying. And publishing is a for-profit industry. So if they see people are buying books by underrepresented people, then they will publish more books by underrepresented people. It's not often, I think, that... Um, Capitalism is part of the solution, but in this instance, purchasing books can help be part of the solution. Um, not the whole solution by any means, but it can contribute in a positive way. Reading those books after you purchase them <laughs> also helps because it helps maintain the mindset of diversity matters, inclusion matters, representation matters, um, especially when you are getting kids, young adults, these books, um, you know, teenage brains and younger are much more plastic than adults' brains, and exposing kids, one, underrepresented kids deserve to see themselves in media because that's what teaches them that they can do anything and two white kids <laughs> need to see these underrepresented communities because it helps teach them empathy and it helps teach them not to center their own worldview not to assume that theirs is the worldview that matters um and i think it's also you know adults may have to work a little bit harder at it but we can learn new things too. <laughs> and it's important for us to also remember that empathy matters and that centering whiteness doesn't need to be the default. It shouldn't be the default. We should be celebrating all kinds of different cultures and people and identities that are not our own. Um, So something that I wanted to kind of touch on, um, cause I was watching Ashley at Bookish Realms, some of her Vlogmas videos that she posted in the month of December. And one of them was on why reading diversely matters. And she has much more intelligent things to say <laughs> than I do. You should definitely check out her video. Um, but one of the things that she said that really struck me was people claiming that they couldn't read diversely because they read 
as a means of escapism and they read for fun and they're not trying to learn anything with their reading. Um, and I kind of wanted to unpack that <laughs> a little bit because I also, I do read to learn. I do enjoy learning new things and I did read plenty of nonfiction this year for exactly that reason. But I do also read for escapism and to, you know, just live in a world where dragons are real for a minute. And the assumption that you can't find books by underrepresented groups that are also just fluffy and escapist is really problematic. <laughs> um, not everything has to be about someone's trauma or someone's pain. Underrepresented people do not owe us their trauma. Um, you know, that like kind of harkens back to the kerfluffle with Aidan Thomas and they published Lost in the Neverwoods and people were really upset that it didn't I include any explicitly queer characters because Cemetery Boy Boys was about a trans uh, person. And, you know, <laughs> they don't owe us our trauma, their trauma. They don't these stories don't have to be these, like, heavy, bleak, traumatic experiences. I read plenty of books this year with main characters that were minority racial identities, and their race did not play into the story in any way other than to, like, be a background flavor. Um, Yes, you're still learning things from these if you don't know much about, you know, Cuban food, for example. <laughs> Read Sal and Gabby Break the Universe. Um, the main character is Cuban, and that doesn't propel the story forward. It just changed the food that he talked about eating for lunch or dinner, you know? Like... The story was still really fluffy and cute and a sweet story. So people saying that they want to read for escapism and so they're not going to read diversely is a cop out and like kind of a gross one. <laughs> um, even even in nonfiction, reading books by people of color does not mean that you have to be reading about race. Um, no one assumes that a book by a white person is going to be about being white. Y you know, we can just write whatever we want to, and it's taken as a given. Um, and I think that this is something that we really need to be pushing for as readers is to make it so that publishing accepts books on any topic by any person. It doesn't, you know, we don't want, to have, we don't want authors of color pigeonholed into writing about their race. Um, and I, so I mentioned previously, I did read 33 books this, that were nonfiction this year. And yeah, a lot of them were about race, but a lot of them weren't. Like I read a couple of books about food, like Buttermilk Graffiti, um, All About Love by Bell Hooks. Race plays into it, but it wasn't a book about race. Um, I read a couple of books about yoga. <laughs> like, you can be learning things and still supporting authors of color. And I think that that's a direction that we need readers to be moving in. All right, I'm kind of losing the thread here. So before I launch into another rant, um, I'm just gonna conclude this 
video by saying that I am really glad that I challenged myself in this way this year. Um, <laughs> it's totally possible that I will spend the next three months, you know, reading Wheel of Time. <laughs> and, uh, but I'm definitely not going to go back to a place where I'm only reading white people and not even noticing that I'm only reading white people. Um, I think this year has been really good for me in terms of personal growth, reading growth, and I really want to keep that momentum moving forward. So yeah, I don't think I'll ever go back. <laughs> and that really pleases me. So stay safe out there, y'all. Bye.